Welcome to Health Raisers. Health Raisers don't just survive, together we thrive. I'm your host, Dr. Nadine. Today, my guest is Laura Viviana. She is a writer and editorial director from New York, currently based out of Denver, Colorado. We met in the podcasting workshop, in a Kimball workshop that was founded by Seth Godin and Alexandra De Palma. And after a lucky one on one chat, I just knew Laura. You were the right person to be on my podcast today addressing what it feels like to contend with identity, so many facets of identity, exploring your own creative voice, and managing the stress of it all. Take it away, my friend. Thank you so much, Nadine. It's such an honor to be here with you. And Yeah, all of those topics are really dear to my heart and have been very present in my life for as long as I can remember. So here I am. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we're about to take on some light topics, right? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about identity first, because even this morning when we were chatting before this call, I learned more about you that I didn't know about. And I don't want to take away your thunder, so... Dive in however you want to dive in. Oh, gosh. Well, I'll just say before I say anything, I'm still learning all the time. And I'm still unhooking as well from systems of harm, internalized systems of harm. And so I'll just say that I'm in I'm in it. And yeah, so I was born in Colombia and adopted to a Caucasian family. Uh, and I grew up in Long Island and grew up with a lot of different otherness. I grew up being the brownest kid at school. And um, except for actually one one kid was Indian, now that I remember, but he was kind of a bully. <laughs> but, <laughs> but grew up in a very, like, I always refer to it as a lily white town. Like, you know, it was a very conservative, very Caucasian town. And then, but it was New York, you know, so there is some multi, you know, you just, you go half an hour west and the the dynamic changed or the diversity changed. And then growing up, I, you know, as we were talking about earlier in our, in our BIPOC group, I have struggled a lot with where do I fit in? Where does it, where do I feel most like me? You know, I'm also queer. um, So there's, there's a lot of um, different spaces to sort of contend with. I love my adopted family. They're, they're really, you know, they're remarkable people in their own ways. And at the same time, you know, transracial adopt adoption is not a thing that people were learning about in the 1980s. They were not, they didn't understand even regular, regular adoption is a very deep experience and it's a very multifaceted experience and it's not something to be taken lightly. But I think that's something that people have come to learn only in the last 20 years or so. So we're talking about almost 40 years ago, you know, and that was a very different uh, time. And so there, we, we weren't having the conversations that we're having now back mm-hmm. then. Mm-hmm. And so I'll pause there and take a, a sip of water <laughs> because that was a lot. <laughs> I want you to talk to us about what it feels like to navigate in the physical body you're in, a world where you are trying to belong. And the reason why I say that is because I just watched something by Brene Brown and I was floored when I heard her say this. She said that the opposite of belonging is fitting in. It stopped me right in my tracks and I'm still processing it. But What I heard in that is that fitting in carries a lot of stress and threat to your safety, psychologically, emotionally, physically, mentally. And that's some of what I heard in what you were saying as you navigated various facets of your identity through your life. 
So can you talk about the stress and maybe the lack of feeling safe because you didn't exactly, you were trying so hard to fit in and not quite belonging? Oh, yeah. The first thing I'll say is I think that talk to any anthropologist or even psychologist and they'll tell you that belonging is such a deep human need for all of us. And the way that our societies are built out now, we don't we don't really have belonging the way that we might have, you know, in other parts of human history, I think, because of the way that everything's structured now, you know, and the world is so big and so interconnected on a global level. So I'll just say that first, which is that belonging is such a a deep need. And I think that growing up, if you are different, and, and this goes for people that are not adopted or that are not you know, there's so many different ways of, of being in a family, right? And I, it's, so this isn't just about being adopted and being a different race than my family. It's it's also, I think, plenty of people who are biological experiences too, where there, you just, you don't necessarily feel quite like you are part of the unit. You know, there, not that my family ever made me feel that way. Just to clarify, like there was always a great deal of pride around like being adopted. But growing up with difference and growing up with otherness, belonging is a shifty thing. And I can't remember who said it, someone that I really respect. So maybe their name will come to me. It might have, it might have been Starhawk who said, um, you know, that that there are some people in the world that just their journey, part of their journey is never fully clicking in. And when you have one foot out and one foot in, you're walking a different path and you're, you're it's almost like you're walking between worlds kind mm-hmm. of all the time. And so as someone who has passed as white or even passed as the wherever I am, you know, I've lived in Thailand and Indonesia and I people come up to me in those countries thinking I'm, you know, a local. So living in those places and like that was a relatively positive experience in a lot of ways, right? But there's always that tightrope for me personally where I've I've grown up with white privilege simply by being raised by a white family. But I've grown up with the systems of harm for people of color because I've experienced harm in different ways because of colorism and because of otherness. So there's that, it's both and, right? I'm like always on that. Mm-hmm. Right? I think what I what I want to say ultimately is that fitting in, I don't know that fitting in has ever actually been an option because I would never physically did. And so when there's such, I think fitting in can be nefarious in the sense that a lot of people are doing it and maybe they don't even realize they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's what happens in midlife crises, right? People sort of wake up one day and they're like, oh my gosh, I've been living this life that, that was actually determined for me by other people's opinions my whole life, you know? And, and so I don't know for, for better or for worse. I I don't know that I ever had that option simply because the otherness was immediate. And so while I experienced belonging and I, you know, my, my family divorced when I was, or my parents divorced when I was fairly young and their belonging for me has been a play. I belong and usually more in independent relationships one-on-one, you know, with people. When Brene Brown talks about fitting in, in that context, I think what she's saying is self-betrayal. I think she's talking about subconsciously or consciously betraying the self in order to feel that one is fully in a group or integrated in a group. Whereas belonging is true, authentic realness being fully accepted in that group. And I could say, I guess the only place where I could say I really feel that is probably when I'm around, when I'm in the queer community, even though I often pass as straight. <laughs> so there's, there's all these different spaces. That's interesting because that was my next question for you is where do you then feel a sense of community? Because you said it's more one-on-one, but then you go on to say that it's in the queer community. And I also find that curious that you say I also pass for straight. I'd like to hear more about that. What does that mean? You know, it's it's kind of I I what I- at one point in my 20s, I went across the country for six months and lived out of a car and in campgrounds uh, with an ex-partner of mine who did not pass as 
this is, again, this is also about 20 years ago, maybe 24 years ago. Oh my gosh, I'm aging myself. But we could walk into a store and it's so obvious that people treat her differently than me because she did not read as a femme. For me, when I walk down the street with a male partner, my experience of safety is very different than when I walk down the street of with, you know, street with a female partner. But I can walk down the street with a female partner and people won't necessarily assume that she's my partner. Okay. I think passing a street just has to do with, with, the, with gender representation. You know, I think I just look what people mm-hmm. perceive to be a straight, mm-hmm. which again, it's a privilege. You know, it's, it's, another, it's another intersectionality of privilege. So you've talked about a couple of so-called benefits of passing, uh, whether it be because of the color of your skin or because you appear straight by whatever concocted rules we use to label and categorize people. What are some examples of harm? Uh, maybe some physical harm uh, that you have, if you're comfortable to share. Oh, yeah. And, and or psychological harm that you've experienced by not belonging or not fitting in. Yeah. So really, really, I'd say really direct instances of, of racism and probably ableism in my younger, you know, when I talk about, I want to clarify this, when I talk about growing up in a lily white town, that was up until um, adolescence. And then I moved to a much more diverse town and school. But I, you know, in, in my youth and, you know, I went to Catholic school and there's a lot of bullying. There was, you know, a lot of physical, a lot of physical bullying. So kids were brutally, I mean, I think it wasn't just me. I think probably there was a culture of violence uh, in the school where I was, you know, experiencing these things. There is people, um, people in charge, adults in charge tended to turn a blind eye to these instances, you know, uh, one time uh, a girl put Fantastic in my milk and and Fantastic the cleaner, oh. and put it on my lunch, and you know when I you know like went into my cubby, you know, she's older. I think you know again these are things that I look back on this stuff and and you look at kids now and it's like there is. There's no way that those acts of violence are not done by people who are also suffering a tremendous amount, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, I was, I had these experiences of victimization, but when I look back, I mean, I don't think anybody that was experiencing that or, or perpetrating it were fine. (laughs) You know, like I don't Mm -hmm. think those kids were fine. Mm -hmm. Microaggressions have happened a lot for me, even recently, you know, in, in work settings, uh, in, um, in all kinds of ways. But, you know, growing up, if you were, if you were Latino or Latina growing, growing up where I grew up, people assumed that you were either a recent, um, undocumented worker or that you were, um, under, you know, under or uneducated. And so I did, I've been working since I was 12 and I started working wherever I could, you know, I just came from that kind of a a family, like, you know, if you Mm want to, you know, make, make money if you want it. So I started out in the service industry and and nannying. I did a ton of childcare. And in a lot of those scenarios, the microaggressions were just like, they were crazy. (laughs) You know, they were Mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, I got called the girl a lot. I got spoken to in a way where people just assumed I didn't speak uh, English, you know. Were they yelling at you like in movies too or speaking slowly? It was a lot of like (laughs) speaking slowly as though, you know, as though if you didn't know English, you, you know, were (laughs) like an idiot. I don't know. People, but again, we're talking about a place, you know, in my younger childhood, there's a lot of, there's a lot of wealth. There's a lot of privilege. You know, the mm. East of Long Island is a very specific place. It's not quite the Hamptons, right? But it's, it's definitely very insulated, but all, all kinds of, all kinds of things like that. You know, um, I had an instance in a job where I was encouraged to write about things that had to do with diversity and an entire team agreed upon this this plan of action. And when um, somebody in the company didn't like how it went, they came to me and I got yelled at and I got blamed for it, even though my superiors were the ones that signed off on it and agreed on it. 
you know, um, being talked over. That happens a lot. It, it could be a gender thing, but I experience it in groups of, of white women as well. So shifting power dynamics is what you're talking about, depending on the culture where you are. It's you're talking power dynamics is what I'm hearing. Absolutely. And I just want to acknowledge that I don't want to pretend that these are, you know, like the most egregious things that could happen to a person based on, you know what I mean? Like I I recognize that these are relatively, in some ways, minor comparatively with, you know, certain experiences in this country, you know. But I will also say that in some ways I, I disagree lightly simply because you're experiencing experiencing these things on a small level, it's like slight cuts, you know, but they're constant and you never know who, which direction they'll be coming from. So I think that does encourage an ongoing stress response because you're never quite sure. Yeah, exactly. It creates a hypervigilance in a way. Mm-hmm. The one thing that actually for me is it gives me kind of a lot of I don't think cognitive dissonance is the word, but it's a little bit, it's that constant wondering, am I being treated this way because of this Mm -hmm. or this? Mm -hmm. Like, like, is this because I'm a woman? Is this because I'm not white? Is this because I walked into this restaurant with a limp? Like in some, uh, in some circumstances, I walk into a place and I get followed around and people are expecting me to shoplift, right? And in other circumstances, I can look exactly the same and I walk into a place and people are like, how can I sell this thing to you better, right? Or like, how can I, you know, make you a customer for life, right? So there's, you know, there's, it's so, it's so varied. You never mm-hmm. know, you know, but I think that is the thing. I think the thing for me is always like, was that a microaggression? And it's so much energy. It's so much energy mm-hmm, to have mm-hmm. to be like, why did that person talk to me that way? Or why am I being ignored? Or why am I being suspected? That kind of thing. Okay. So I have a couple of, of questions here for you. I know you joined the podcasting workshop because you said that it was time for you. You've been writing for others as a ghostwriter, and it was time for you to find, unveil, release your own voice. How have you been experiencing doing that? How, how have you been navigating doing that, finding your own voice? I'm still in the process, Nadine. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you know, I was writing a lot on my own blog for many years, and then I took a little bit of a hiatus. Um, some pretty major life-altering things happened in my life, and I really had to focus on just getting myself together and getting grounded and, and recovering. Um, and so it's been several years since I've really been writing. Um, I think that writers can go through that process where they just need to marinate and kind of go into hiding, even for sometimes years, maybe even decades at a time, that happens. I will say that I've been a professional copywriter and ghostwriter for pretty much my whole career. It always looks on paper like I've taken one step after the other and it's like been this straight line, but it's actually been really, it's felt like it's been all over the place. I have... One thing that I told myself several years ago that I wasn't going to do anymore, I I just want to say that I don't mean any disrespect to anybody that I've worked with in the past by saying this. You know, I've been incredibly grateful for my clients and the people that I have had the privilege of working with. But I will say when I have ghosts written for people, I noticed that I, a lot of times, I took a lot of my own wisdom, a lot of really hard earned wisdom from tremendous adversity and was taking a lot of those lessons and a lot of that energy and life force and putting it into other people's work. And then they were going out into the world and presenting as though that was theirs because that's what that's what they paid me for, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. And so at some point I said, you know what, I, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm either going to work with people who really have their own wisdom to bring that I can help birth and I can help and I can help massage or I'm just going to work for brands, right? Which is mostly what I do is I write for brands, but writing for individuals that have had exceedingly different life circumstances, often with a lot more privilege. That became unsustainable for my spirit, essentially. Okay, so that leads right into what I was gonna ask. It sounds like a lot of what you're describing is, with gratitude, you can, it. nothing is simple, nothing is black and white. 
that's a cognitive distortion. But to me, it sounds like a lot of survival and it sounds like you want to actually thrive. Am I right? Am I not reading that correctly? Is there a difference for you? Sure. Well, I think I became, and again, you know, it's not that I have, I'm not grateful for my career, but I chose my career path. I went to school for poetry and creative writing has always been the thing that I, you know, I focused on the most out of all the creative pursuits, but I went into writing for business for survival, you know, because I, A, I didn't come from a family that that I didn't come from an academic family. You know, I didn't come from a family with a lot of higher ed. I came from a family that was like, you've got to study something that will provide for you. You know, my dad nearly had a heart attack Mm -hmm. when he found out my major was going to be poetry. And um, so writing for business and marketing and advertising really did start out as survival for me, just across the board. And then I was attracting a lot of people, you know, this was 15 years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, the online solo entrepreneurial world really exploded. There were so many people that went off on their own and obviously it's still happening, right? But it was almost like it was a different generation in a way, you know, 10, 15 years ago that were, that were doing it they're all now either onto something else or retired. And so I was writing for this huge influx of mostly white women writing and online. And so I've ghostwritten for, you know, a few prominent people and I don't regret any of that, but yeah, you don't, you don't know these things until you know them, you know, you don't know oh, hey, maybe it's not in my best interest to be giving away my precious gems in a transactional situation with somebody else that's getting credit for that work. So would you say that's a way that you are navigating unwanted stress or stress that you can control to the extent that you can control it, where at least if you're using your voice, then you're being recognized for it. I'm I'm wondering if that's a form of self-care for you. Oh, for sure. I'm sure there's a lot of writers out there that will feel similarly, which is that when you write for anybody, whether you feel like you're selling out or not, when you're writing for someone else or for a brand uh, or different brands for a decade, you're going to learn how to how to write differently and write for KPIs. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. it's a completely different skill set than funneling your own wisdom, funneling your own spirit into an art. You know, the difference between writing for business and writing for art is when you write for art, I feel like it's almost what people call is almost like channeling. You know, you are distilling your experience from your like body into the world, onto the page. Whereas it's almost, you know, it's copy is just sales in writing, you know, and ghostwriting is telling other people's stories. So you hone other skills. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, that was, that was kind of a, just to, just to shout out to all the writers out there. If you feel like you've lost your voice, you've been writing for everyone else. It's okay. It's a normal, really normal feeling. For me, I mean, practice, and I need to take my own advice here, but practice, daily practice, you know, journaling, writing things down when they come to you, you know, those bursts of inspiration. So much of when you're a professional creative, so much of your creativity is going towards the thing that you're, that's your livelihood. When you are struggling, it's again, it's towing that line. It's another line to tow. It's another tightrope, right? Of like, how much creative energy do I reserve for myself and my own voice? And how much do I give? Because it's literally my job to show up and be creative every single day, you know, Um, which is no pressure at all. It's like easy. No, it's not. <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard. For me, reclaiming your voice can happen. One of the best things about writing is you can do it whenever. You can do it, you know, a week before your deathbed. You can reclaim your voice and say, no, I have some things to say and I need it to be in my own voice, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think probably to tie back into what we spoke about earlier around just being visible, I think what happens is when you experience microaggressions, or any 
violence just for being alive, just for walking down the street or just for interacting with other people based on how you look or based on otherness. You have to have something inside of you that fights against that your whole life so that you can have a voice, right? Because yes. just existing has been traumatic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because mm-hmm. of systems of harm, people's internalized systems of harm that they then enact on, on out onto each other, right? And so I think reclaiming your voice or reclaiming my voice, I can only speak for myself, is, is not just about reclaiming my voice after many years of writing for others, but it's, it's reclaiming, uh, space really, because it can be really hard to take up space when you've experienced that kind of harm. So I also wonder then, it sounds like to me, I'm not hearing regret. I'm hearing lessons learned along the way. Do you think that these lessons have informed your ability to truly love yourself? Because I think we get very, you know, this is something in the zeitgeist right now where it's like, oh, self-love, love love yourself. You know, but what are we really talking about? It doesn't necessarily mean the positive, happy thing necessarily that we're supposed to think it means. I think it means, at least when I coach my clients, it's really accepting all those facets of yourself, all of those lessons, taking all of that and truly being able to stand in the mirror and say, I'm not perfect or I don't look the way I think I'm supposed to look or necessarily sound the way I'm supposed to look, whatever that means. But I truly do love myself because I accept that I'm imperfect. I'm imperfect in a lot of ways, but I'm also perfect in a lot of other ways too, because I'm myself. And so I wonder if a journey like that, if that resonates with you, makes it more possible to feel a sense of belonging no matter where you are. Mm. So for the first part around self-love, I think self-love is kind of a trap as a concept. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. What do we even mean by that? I always say that self-care is self-love in action. The thing about love is we always talk about it or we, we, or at least I grew up with all these Disney stories of love and, you know, romantic love and all these different kinds of love. And a lot of times the, in the collective consciousness, I think there's an idea that love can end. Like you can break up with someone and stop loving them. And so I think we have this distorted view of like, what is, what does love mean? You know, for me, what comes up for me right now is I'm like, I feel like for me, self-love is like self-endurance. It's like, you know what? I might feel like shit, but I'm going to show up anyway. I'm going to, you know, and sometimes showing up doesn't mean like going out there and getting some high powered position or something. Sometimes self-love means like, I'm going to stop and drink a glass of water, you know? Um, because, Because at the end of the day, it's about honoring yourself you know, as best as you can with all the expectations of, of people, of human beings in the modern world, right? Also, I will say that you can't do life on your own. I don't think people can do life on their own. Like, I actually think Western individualism is super damaging to internalize that as, you know, that's the only way that you can really prove that you love yourself or something. Like, oh, if I get up and I go to yoga and then have a smoothie somehow... I, I love myself, you know, like it's <laughs> sometimes for me, like self-love, like the most loving thing I can do for myself is reach out to someone else and say, I can't hold everything right now. I need somebody to, to be with me in this. Mm-hmm. You know? So if you can cultivate more of, of that true, that real loving yourself, do you think that can contribute to a better sense of belonging? Yeah. I think that journey doesn't stop. It's not like one day Mm -hmm. you wake up and you're like, I love myself and I belong. Yay. Done. (laughs) You know, I think that when you have kind of a multifaceted identity and you have, you know, early childhood trauma and you have all of these different types of fracturings, you kind of spend the rest of your life working through all of the ways in which you've been divorced from yourself. And I think that it's like simple daily practices of just tuning in with yourself and saying, what do I need right now? What, you know, maybe what I don't need to do is answer an email. Maybe what I need is a snack or a walk or a breath of sunshine. Breath of sunshine. That was good. That was poetic. I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) 
goals. So I think, you know, and, and like I said, I'm, I feel like I've been on this road for so long, but I feel like such a newbie when it comes to finding my place in the world. You know, a lot Mm -hmm. of people find their identity and their belonging through, you know, their spiritual groups or their, you know, immediate family of origin. Not that I don't feel, you know, a a tremendous profound sense of love for my family of origin, but I don't live in the same town. We don't live in the same house. You know, it's, it's just, and like any other modern dynamic, so many of us are separated from the people that we came from, right? Physically with distance. Mm -hmm. So I think true belonging is maintaining a sense of self in, inside of groups. I think when you show up authentically, that's when you find the people where you do really, where you do belong, right? So the closer you get to your own self, your own trueness, like trueness, that's not a word, but your own, I I don't like the word authenticity. I feel like it's been overused, but the closer you get to, to really being you, being you and knowing yourself, the more I think you, your guide, you guide yourself and you are guided to spaces and to groups of people that want exactly what you are. Something that I I really wish to express here is how much gratitude I have for our conversation because this is something else that I'm hearing a lot, especially during our more and more tumultuous times right now, social times. It's like, oh, we should be having more conversations. People say that and it's like, but are you really having those conversations and how are you having them? Because to have those conversations means stepping outside of your comfort zone. And it also means that you listen, you use real listening skills and you seek out hearing experiences from people that don't look like you, haven't grown up like you, don't sound like you, don't look like you. And so I'm really, really happy that we we're able to have this talk today because to me, this is conversation where I don't have to be right. You don't have to be right. We're just listening and we're just talking to one another. And I'm getting a glimpse of hearing from you what it may have been like to navigate a world through um, a disability or through being queer or being a person of color, uh, the whole thing with being able to pass um, and how you are constantly not shape-shifting, but assessing a situation. And I think this is where empathy can really be born, right? I have one of my favorite authors is Natalie Nixon, and she says that um, the root of empathy is inquiry. And so there's this asking of these questions so that now I'm more informed. I can go out into the world and if I see somebody, because I'm an impatient person, I am. That's something I'm constantly working on. So if I'm out somewhere and I see somebody in a mobilized shopping cart, maybe I pause and I go, oh, I have to rush around this person because I have to get out of here or whatever. And I I pause and I go, I don't know what this person is going through. I don't know why this person is in this chair. This is, this could be me. And maybe I do pause and maybe I do slow down and honor that impatience and act accordingly. You know, behave the way I want to behave and show up and stop reacting to and being a little bit more responsive and and bringing more kindness into the world in a real incentivized, in a real intentional way because I want to. Yeah. Yeah. So I thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I I have another question for you. I ask everybody, based on everything we've been talking about, based on all of the wisdom you've brought to this conversation, your experiences, in this moment, what is your personal definition of what it means to be healthy? It's very challenging to be healthy in the world we live in for so many different reasons. You know, don't get me started about the healthcare system. But everything is simple, as simple as having more connection or more time on your phone than, you, than you're having with people in real life, right? So I would say, to me, being healthy is 
not beating yourself up for not being able to keep up with with systems that are trying to extract from you. It's a very anti-capitalist answer, but it's like being healthy is going to look different for every single person in every single different strata. Every, you know, like I could sit here and talk about nutrition or exercise, or right? But it's going, but for me, I actually think that the definition of being healthy is giving yourself a break. You know, just give yourself a break because life is really hard. Maybe it's not hard for you right now, but there will come a time when you're going to hit some wall in your life and you're going to have to give yourself a break and you're going to realize that maybe you've internalized things that weren't true to you and the untangling of that takes time and patience. I would say that just breathe, <laughs> give yourself some space. One thing I've experienced in the last few years, you know, I've, I've been through some pretty extreme ex things in my life. And one of the things that I wish for everyone to have, because I think developing empathy also comes from developing humili humility, knowing Absolutely. that life is chaotic and life can happen to anybody at any point. And just because mm -hmm difficulties haven't visited your door or you've been able to cope with difficulties different than somebody else doesn't mean that you're a better member of society. I look at the ways in which I've been held because of my privilege and because of the, the things I was able to build up before hard times came to my doorstep. Not everyone has that. And so for me, I mean, it's like they're Therefore, by the grace of God, go I. I think it's that that saying, right? You know, just to say that we're all in something, you know, we're, we're all in this thing called life and you never know what can happen. And so it sounds so trite, but it's like you just never know what someone else is going through and you never know when you could be in that same situation. Absolutely. I actually really want to ask you the self-love question. What does it mean for you and what's your journey been with that? My journey has been very much on the, I'm a big people pleaser. So it's been very much external. Am I doing everything quote unquote right? Am I satisfying this person? Does this person like me? Does this person love me? Am I this enough? Am I that enough? What can I do to prove my worth? That's been my journey with self-love for a very long time. I would definitely say I did not love or value myself for a very, very, very long time. I was looking for it on the outside. That's kind of where my question for you became came from was this idea of do you think as you journey in your life and you you learn more lessons and you learn to start accepting certain things about yourself and, and just being you and being okay with that, if that leads to more of a sense of belonging versus outside in, where I'm looking for signals to say that I'm okay. Mm -hmm. That was my journey for a long time. And then that journey became extremely self-destructive. And so I had to make a choice about 11 years ago. And that was Am I really so unworthy? Where are my narratives coming from? Why am I doing this to myself? Why can I be such a wonderful mother and daughter and wife and be so horrific to myself? So for me, self-love became a lot about practicing, stumbling, falling, getting back up and practicing acceptance. Practicing is going to be okay. Practicing, I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to look a certain way. I don't have to sound a certain way. If I'm okay with it, the more comfortable I am with myself, the more I can occupy the skin I'm in and like really take, take up space in it, the better off I'm going to be for myself and then for other people afterwards. And in making those slow realizations, and they're still evolving, I have become a better member of my community, whatever community that may be. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I mean, I really relate to that. I feel like I'm still in that. I'm still, 
you know, when I look back on my life, there have been times in my life when I'm like, oh my gosh, how could I have made those choices? You know, but then I look at all the different things that were running in the background for me, right? The, the, whether it was people pleasing or coping mechanisms, you know, like so much of psycho- psychology, I don't know if you notice this, but psychology, especially trauma work is really making traction right now. And, it, and there's, there are, there's an understanding around the brain and trauma and systemic harm and all of these things that we contend with as modern people, there's way more understanding around it now than there ever has been. And so when I look back on all the ways in which I like betrayed myself here, 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 you know, all these little little places, I'm like, oh, I, I can forgive myself for in my perception, succumbing to things that were maybe in my best interest, but which I was led to. And of course I would be led to those things, right? Because of all the factors at play, you know? And I think, I think that also helps you build empathy when you really, you, when you look at the constellation of someone's life and all the things that they've had to go deal with and then constitutional, right? Cause like we're all born with a different constitution and we can all handle things differently. There's almost for me, and there's the deep sense of of empathy, you know, for for other people on their journey. And I feel like what I'm hearing from you too is self forgiveness, you know. And then every day, just saying, I don't know, like falling and then getting back up. And you mentioned regrets earlier. I totally have regrets. I'm sure I'll have more, by the, you know, <laughs> 30 years from now. But. Um, but I think, you know, the thing with regrets is like, if you, if you don't have any, maybe you, you haven't lived hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> I bring it back to Brene Brown. She said, stop working your shit out on other people. Yeah. Yeah. So this is mental health. This is a mental health domain we're in right now. And it's not a sign of shame. I'm glad we're destigmatizing it. But I really want to say that. I've had therapy, continue to have therapy. It doesn't mean that something is wrong with you, but we all have our stuff and it's a good idea to work it out with a professional bystander (laughs) and not with people you love and care about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think therapy is um, really wonderful and I love how it's becoming hopefully more accessible. You know, I've lived in other places in the world where therapy was like really stigmatized, like way more than the States, you know? And so um, I feel really grateful that I grew up in like a therapy forward family. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I I also wonder, I mean, I hope this isn't too much of a challenge to what you just said, but I also wonder just as we are, as we are interrelational beings, you know, or just relational beings, like I feel like it's inevitable that we end up having shit come up with other people. And then we have to, I think it's also the piece of grace where you pull back and you're like, oh, whoa, I totally just projected that. Or I totally just, that wound from when I was seven just totally came out in this interaction with a colleague or with a friend, you know? Right. Coming back to that and being like, okay, I'm really sorry, you know, Mm -hmm. working through it. Um, But I, but yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I mean, not just therapy too, though, support groups, all kinds of, there's all kinds of ways I think to be together in our shit in a way that's, that's healthy and therapeutic Mm -hmm. and de-shaming. That's not a word, but (laughs) (laughs) I think I have a lot of non-words on this podcast and I am a writer. So hello, (laughs) I am a writer and I just (laughs) picked up random words as I talk. So. All right. I think, yeah, we did what I wanted to do. I hope we did what you wanted to do. Absolutely. Thanks for creating such a beautiful space to have these conversations. You know, it's not easy to talk about a lot of this stuff. It's not, but I don't shy away from, I don't swim on on the top, on the surface. I love to dive deep and I'm a lifelong learner. I practice curiosity and It's not easy. It's not necessarily comfortable. But how am I going to show up as the Nadine I want to be if I don't do this? Exactly. I want to be proud of myself. So I thank you for coming to my space and swimming deeply with me. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you so much. (laughs) Hey. 
Thanks for being here. It really means a lot to me. One of my higher purposes in life is to help women thrive, not just survive. Here's a testimonial about my work from a trusted and respected colleague, author, coach, Bernadette Jiwa. In a world that is constantly telling us who we should be, it's very hard to show up as yourself. And you're helping people to do that every day. If you want to work with me, if you don't want to just settle, contact me at npkhealthintegration.com. Let's connect. Let's connect.